Welcome to the Gur in Fangirl podcast, a podcast where we discuss pop culture and fandom. Each episode, we talk with celebrities, fans, and creators about their work in the media that inspires them. Now, here's your host, the creator of the Squee Project, filmmaker, fangirl, and feminist, Hansi Oppenheimer. Hey, it's Hansi, and today I'm talking with Andrea Subisati. She's the executive editor of Rumor Magazine, co-host and producer of the Faculty of Horror podcast, and the co-founder of the Black Museum. Her work combines her passion for horror, sociology, ACA fandom, and feminism. If you're not listening to her podcast, Faculty of Horror, you're really missing out. So after you listen to our chat, go subscribe to her podcast. You won't be sorry. And here we go. Hi, Andrea. It's Hansi. Hi, Hansi. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Thanks so much for being so understanding about yesterday. I'm so sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. I, it tends to be, you know, people like us who have a lot of projects it's always a little tricky with scheduling so I totally understand Thanks. <laughs> I'm just glad to talk to you today so um, I want to tell you how much I adore your work I love Faculty of Horror um, oh, thank loved you, your That's board nice. forever but even before I knew who you were you know and then Faculty of Horror I was like oh my god there should be more podcasts like this why aren't there <laughs> oh yay it's such a unique podcast well I think it used to be Sorry, that was my phone. <laughs> That's okay. Oh. Yeah, I think uh, I think a, it used um, to be really unique, but nowadays there's uh, there seems to be another one starting up every minute. It's awesome. Oh, that's great. Hey, I I'll have to look for them because it's a unique intersection of you know feminism, um, ACA fandom, and you know passion for horror. So yeah, thanks. <laughs> So um, I, I wanted to talk to you because I've been talking to, you know, women in horror. I've been doing a series about conversations with women in horror. And a lot of the people uh-huh. I've spoken with have been actors or producers and directors. Um, okay. So what you do is a little different. Um, uh-huh. And I thought it was really interesting, you know, because you come from a sociology background. So yes. um, I, I was wondering how that, you know, how that you take that approach with horror. How does that work for you? Uh, well, it, uh, it actually kind of surprised me. I fell in love with sociology when I was doing my undergrad, and uh, sociology is the kind of thing that, like, once it bites you, you see it everywhere, you know? It's almost like feminism, where it just, it takes blinders off, and you see absolutely everything around you in a completely different light. So I became very passionate about it, and originally I wanted to write my master's thesis on knitting, which was something else I was really passionate about. Um, this was, like, the uh, the late 90s, the early aughts, and so feminists were kind of reclaiming knitting, and there were all these books uh, that were really, yeah, like, sure. kitschy and, like, domestic, celebrating domesticity, and I was like, this is so interesting that, the, that it's swinging back like this. And then, uh, when I was in my graduate studies, we started learning some more contemporary theory, and I was like, hey, man, this could be applied to film. You know, film is very much a language. Film very much... Um, teaches us how to exist in our culture and within our generation, you know, like we learn certain things from our parents, we learn certain things from each other, but by and large, uh, TV and media is probably the big, biggest educator in that respect, and so, and so I was a huge horror fan, obviously, and I was like, man, you can apply sociological concepts to narratives that are happening in horror movies, and... Um, the more I did that, the more I, the more fascinated I became with horror movies, and uh, so yeah, it just kind of came from there. Yeah, it's um, it, it's really interesting because so I had been sort of studying fandom. That was sort of my fandom was my fandom, and was okay. really interested in the history of fandom, and you know how women have really sort of been the unspoken heroes of fandom forever. You know, running the fan clubs uh-huh. and the zines and. And uh, But I came from um, the person who my co-creator originally is a clinical psychologist. So my, okay. the way I looked at everything was very much about identity and, you know, that. Yeah. And then um, I spoke to another sociologist who is studying fan activism. And so, like, she sort of explained the difference of the way I was looking at it as the way she looks at it. And I was like, 
Oh, that's a whole new. <laughs> now I have to look at that because that's really interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's super interesting. Did she talk about uh, <laughs> horror specifically, or just just general um, fan culture? Just general fan activism. Um, how uh, so many fandoms, uh, and you do see this in horror fandoms so much. Um, you know, do a lot of charity work and raise a lot of money okay. for charity. Mm-hmm. So, so that's her particular focus. But um, gotcha. not specifically to horror, but I, I definitely see that in horror communities where there's a lot of mm-hmm. fundraising and um. neat. <laughs> so, in terms of the the sociological aspect of you know films, like what are you seeing in terms of like the films, the representation we're seeing now? Because we're definitely you know looking for more representation in our media, and, and we're getting it's getting better, but not you know it's it's, it's a small amount, but we're still getting some. I mean, what do you think about what we're seeing now? I think horror is a really unique case study in terms of representation because it's uh, it's it's almost problematic from the get go. You know what I mean? Like uh, looking at modern horror, we've got this backdrop of the slasher genre, which you know has historically been pretty sexist. We've got obviously almost all of Hollywood is terribly, terribly racist. So we're already coming at it from a, from a kind of a reparative point of view where we're like, are things getting better or not? And how fast and how well and for whom and by whom, you know, those are all really interesting uh, questions that are being asked these days. And, um, and it's super cool that films are coming out that are, that are addressing that. We've got more voices than ever because of the internet and stuff. More creators are able to get their work out there and disseminated. So it's a really exciting time. I think it's also really interesting how people who have a, a heightened appreciation for representation are also looking backward at the genre, looking back when representation wasn't such a big thing and kind of, you know, reappreciating films like, say, Blackula or Ganja and Hess and being like, okay, you know, this is actually pretty cool, Night of the Living Dead. Like, those gems are out there and they can still be talked about um, with these new perspectives. It's really exciting. Yeah, I um, there's that great uh, well, there's two great documentaries, Horror Noir, which I thought was really yes. well done, and mm-hmm. then um, there's one uh, American Nightmare that talks a lot about you know what was happening um, when Romero and um, Hooper and all those guys what was happening in the country when they were making those films and the things happening on the news that may have influenced. Um, you know what? How they presented? You know what? What? You know, like Kent State sort of influencing Night of the Living Dead, um, or images of that. Um, but uh, how how do you feel about like some of the like? I find some of the films I really love now seem really problematic to me. How do you, you know, juggle that? <laughs> oh, how do I juggle that? Well, you know, I think. Um, <laughs> I think Alex and I have come up against this a lot in the podcast where there's something we don't like about a film, but there are other things that we do like, and I think it's really important to address what is problematic and call it out, but you don't also, you don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater, you know what I mean? This is something that comes up when people are talking about Jeepers Creepers, about Rosemary's Baby, you know, like filmmakers who are legit predators and evil people right. and it feels right. weird celebrating their art but their art is an artifact it's something that exists in society that uh, that that still bears mention um but i do think it's important to call these things out and uh yeah i don't know there's plenty of things that i love in spite of uh in spite of being problematic i mean nothing's perfect right <laughs> <laughs> that's not true no, there's some true. perfect horror films out there what's a perfect horror film <laughs> oh, I think The Descent is pretty near perfect. I think The yeah. Thing is pretty near perfect. Alien, like, actually, I, now that I think of it, even those films, we discuss them on the podcast, I can find I can find little problematic, I can find little grapes with each of them. <laughs> yeah, well, there's always something. I mean, it's, you know, humans are complex. They're, it's not as That's simple right. as, yeah. And then, so the films should be complex. You wouldn't want that's right. By yeah, the I agree with that. 
And I think that there is a bit of a tendency to be like, I want to be the first to point out that this is problematic. You know, it's kind of, it's kind of part and parcel with hot take journalism these days that, you know, everyone's going to be looking at Jordan Peele's new movie under a microscope. You know, he's going to be examined a lot more closely than other creators coming out at this time, simply because he has benefited from that platform. And that's kind of disappointing, but inevitable. Yeah, at least he's making films and, and um, you know, he's, he's out there talking about it, which is good. So uh-huh. I mean, as, long, as long as, you know, we're seeing more, you know, alternative narratives, you know, I want alternative narratives. I don't want to see the same story from the same perspective all the time. So same. Yeah, he's out there doing it. What, what are your favorite films that you've seen lately that you would recommend? Oh, boy. You know, I saw one <laughs> the other day that I really loved. It's called Antrim, the Deadliest Film Ever Made. And this came across my desk because I was working on a feature about Satan in horror, just like the figure of Satan in horror. And this film is about Satan, and apparently, allegedly, this film, uh, one guy saw it and died. He died under mysterious circumstances not long after. This film was shown at a film festival, and the cinema burned down. So, like, the film starts with this kind of docu documentary style where they're talking about why it's the deadliest film ever made. And then there's this disclaimer saying that the filmmakers are not responsible for, like, if anything happens to you after you saw this film, it's not our fault. And you're watching it and you're like, oh my god, what a preposterous gimmick in 2019, right? Like, nobody yeah, watches it. Like William Castle. <laughs> exactly. Like, or Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Like, the the events you're about to see were really hot. Like, no. We can suspend our disbelief. We're, we're media savvy in that way. Anyway, then the actual film happens, and it's wonderful. Like, it stands up, even if it didn't have all that gimmicky stuff at the beginning, which, in retrospect, like, once you've seen the film and assuming you enjoyed it the way I did, I guess it's kind of fun. But I really, really enjoyed the film. I think it's making the festival circuit now. I'm actually... uh, I'm actually bugging Keith at Uncorked to give me more information about a wide release, but you can look for something on that in Rue Morgue soon. Okay, cool. <laughs> I love Rue Morgue. It's such a beautiful magazine. You guys do oh, such a great you. job with it. Thanks. Yeah, it's really beautiful. For a while there, when there was you know no Fangoria and nothing else, I sort of discovered it and it became my favorite. Um, yeah. <laughs> Oh, awesome. That's nice. Thank you. I also find it beautiful. I think it's really nice that Remorque has, already, uh, has always placed such a high priority on its design um, because it's a collectible, right? And horror fans love our collectibles, and you don't want to keep it and keep coming back to it unless it's really a thing of beauty. Yeah, and it absolutely is. And, you know, horror, there's, there's beauty to horror, so, you know, you know, some of my favorite films are, you know, like I know one of your favorite films is The Shining, which is just a beautiful horror film. Yes, it is. Have you seen the trailers <laughs> for Dr. Sleep? Um, I haven't yet. What do you think? Uh, I think uh, I think Mike Flanagan is a competent filmmaker. Um, I think he has a sensitivity and a sensibility about trauma, which is going to be really integral to this story. Uh, what shocked me about the trailer is that it, they recreated some scenes um, and made it look a lot like the original Shining, which, I don't know, did you read Dr. Sleep? Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah, so, like, I don't remember in the book that he, he kind of, like, thought back to it a lot at the Overlook, you know? I felt like he was kind of like, ah, I was really young, I was traumatized, obviously, some fucked up shit went down. So, I'm not sure what that's all about, I'm not sure how I feel about that, but I'll give it the benefit of the doubt, I'll check it out for sure. It might just be the filmmaker, like, I need to do this because <laughs> it's The Shining and I want to play in that playground, you know? Right? It's hard to blame them. Yeah, I would really loved his, um, you know, the House on Haunted Hill series that he did a great job mm-hmm. with that, I thought. Mm-hmm. And I, I really liked Oculus, too. I, uh, I'm, I'm aware that there's kind of mixed reviews of that one, but I dug it. Yeah, I, I, it had moments. I, I wasn't really <laughs> on board, you know, but it had moments. Uh, it was interesting. Oh, that, um, 
Dante. <laughs> Must be someone at the door. Um, oh, do you need to do something? No, or? Jamie's downstairs. It's all good. Okay. Um, so um, what are your feelings about like women in the industry these days? We're seeing you know, much more, um, well, we're seeing more women directing, especially horror and documentary, of course, because there tend to be lower budgets. Um, right. But I just uh, interviewed Jen Wexler recently, who filmed The Ranger I had seen. I'm sorry, do you need uh, me to get rid of it? That's, that's going to screw up your audio, isn't it? Sounds like you be quiet. <laughs> be quiet right now. You going to be quiet? He's tilting his head. He's like, what? I don't speak, <laughs> Mom. Uh, yeah, I caught The Ranger at uh, at a film festival. I got to meet uh, Jen and producer Heather Buckley, and uh, they came to visit me in Toronto not long after they came to the manor. Um, great girls, very talented. Uh, I think it's really interesting when female filmmakers take on the slashers of genre, like, you know, the most notoriously sexist of all the horror subgenres. Um, but I think they did a really great job with it. They had a protagonist who was complex and weird and maniacal, but he wasn't one note, you know, and I thought that was, uh, that's something that female filmmakers really bring to the table. Absolutely. Yeah, it was interesting because I hadn't heard anything about it, so I didn't know it was a slasher film. So I just, you know, it was on Shutter, and I just, it's like, oh, this looks interesting. So in the opening, it's like you really don't know what's, what it's going to be, whether it's going to be a werewolf uh-huh. movie or what, you know. So, so that was kind of fun to see. And it was also fun to see someone who kind of loved punk, you know, although they haven't yes. been through that period. You know, yeah, well, punk and horror, I feel like it uh, it shares a lot of the same DNA. It shares a lot of the same kind of uh, guerrilla DIY attitude of I want this to be aggressive. I want this to be in your face. I, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to do it on zero budget. You know what I mean? Like punk rock, is, uh, it has the same kind of roots. And so, you know, I think Return of the Living Dead, Green Room. I love horror punk movies. Me too. <laughs> Yeah, so even Repo Man, which, you know, is sort of a horror film, but definitely a punk film. Yeah, um, definitely. It, it it has some maybe sci-fi, I don't know. It's, it's just a strange movie. I'm not sure what happened to Alex Cox since then. Um, but for a while there, he was pretty hot. Doing yeah. <laughs> Could be still. Wherever you yeah, are, call I'm, I'm curious about the new Jarmish film. Um, I haven't oh. seen Boy, I was really disappointed. <laughs> oh, I was really disappointed, Hansi. And like, and it's not coming from a from a snotty zombie expert point of view thing. I don't even I don't consider myself a zombie expert anymore. Like, the subgenre has changed so much. And you know, I did my research a really long time ago. I do feel like this heavy-handed zombies are us thing has been done and done and overdone and where I had hoped he might provide a fresh perspective it's um it was a little bit mumblecore it was like um yeah like I a sketch. That. it was like a comedy sketch that went way too long I think he really rested on the laurels of his uh of his cast which rightfully so like the only thing that really makes the movie watchable is this cast, and you want to watch them do whatever, but just after two hours, you're kind of like, okay, I'm embarrassed for them. <laughs> Give them something to do. Give them something to say. Um, but, well, you know, that said, we screened it We screened it for Cinema Cobb to a packed, packed house, and they were dying laughing and having the best time. So uh, there's something to be enjoyed in there somewhere. I'll see it, you know, I don't know, but a, a friend of mine who, you know, was 20 and had never seen a Jim Jarmusch film and didn't know anything about his style or anything, she's like, I saw the worst horror movie the other day. There were all these problems and everyone seemed like they knew they were in a movie. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, that like, fourth yeah, wall like is... Jarmusch. Yeah, yeah. No, but that's I, it. I, I like his earlier films a lot better, I, I think, after, I don't know, I think after Dead Man. Uh, okay. I, I haven't liked his films as much. Um, I didn't like Broken Flowers or the the later stuff, but that's like his really sort of his really low budget DIY, you know, Strange in Paradise and Down by Law, and those. Um, 
And it just feels like a guy out there with a camera, you know? <laughs> yeah, there's filmmakers like that where, like, as soon as they get a lot of money, feel like they need to spend it or I don't know maybe I shouldn't comment but I'm kind of thinking of like Peter Jackson for example I was like yeah say Peter I, Jackson. That's exactly yeah what I was say. his old stuff Absolutely. is so wildly creative and it's like it forces you to be creative when you're on a tight budget you don't you can't just call in a CGI team for Lord of the Rings whatever the fuck yeah I think the Frighteners was his last film that I really loved and then after oh that, yeah that one was cool I know. I just kind of lost it, but yeah, I think. Um, and also, you're you're once you're got that much money, you're dealing with like committee. You know, you don't have yes. as much creative control. So that's I true too. That's, I know that it becomes homogenized, and it's just like so many other films. That so, what what should we be looking for in terms of your projects coming up? When when's the next season of Faculty of Horror, or what are you doing? Well, uh, Faculty of Horror is plugging away. Um, we are going to be launching a Patreon soon, okay. which is something, you know, like we, I'm not going to say that we resisted for the longest time. We were just kind of like, Alex and I were both at peak capacity with doing the research, recording the podcast, and I was editing the podcast. We were starting to pick up a couple of speaking gigs at universities. We're going to Salem every year. Like, stuff was coming up, but we were busy. You know, we had our full-time jobs. We had our writing projects. So we never wanted to launch a Patreon because we couldn't offer any more content. You know, Patreon's whole thing is like, you pay us and you get something in return. And we're like, we're giving you all that we can, you know. Um, We didn't have a donate button. A lot of people donate we had our we have merch drives every single year and a lot of people do pick up our merch which helps us out a lot but we thought you know um if we have a successful patreon we can pick up an editor and that's going to open up some time for us to to get our hands dirty and offer different kinds of content uh and it's still early days we're still figuring out um exactly what we're going to offer in terms of perks. Uh, I would love to hear from our listeners what they would like to see, and and from there we'll just figure out what it is we can do. So, yeah, we are looking at uh, at growing right now. For the longest time, we were just kind of like, no, it's, it's fine the way it is anymore, and it's going to be unmanageable. <laughs> but, uh, but it's well, picking I, up, I man. Our, 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 a, our listeners a, are super listener, passionate. I'm... Go on. I would definitely like to see more behind the scenes on Faculty of Horror. Oh, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I'm curious, like, what goes into making the episodes, and you know, because they, you know, they sound so, you know, just casual conversations that you just know all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you want to see us with our notes, and actually, the, yeah, the cutting room floor, the uh, the editing suite. I mean, we're pretty good. We've been doing this for a long time. Editing is definitely going way faster than it used to. We'd be tripping over sentences and mispronouncing stuff, and so now we know how to come prepared. But oh, that's interesting. Maybe we could do something on the process. Yeah. Our process. <laughs> yeah, I'd be curious because it seems so effortless, you know, and I know it's not. There's no way it can, but it comes off that way. So. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. We're pulling so it off. I don't off. want to break the fourth know. wall there, but. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe not. Might be something. Yeah. <laughs> maybe that's a screen I want to stay behind. <laughs> and how's the Salem thing? I've been dying to come every year, but it's always. Um, October is always tricky because I do press for New York Comic Con, so that's always sort of oh. they sort of overlap. Um, I think it's like mm-hmm. the following weekend, which is always a little tricky. But um, I know how's no, that been going? It looks really fun. It's wonderful. The guy who is do- I've done a lot of conventions in my life, but the guy who is doing Salem Horror Fest is a one man powerhouse and I, I shouldn't say he's one man he's got uh, he's got a great team um who help him allow, uh, who help him out a, a ton very very competent passionate people but he started this from the ground up and i think he had a he had a background in pr and marketing so he knew he knew how to leverage the right people and make it happen and salem is kind of interesting in that and this and this came from kevin he shared this with me last time we were down is that for a while you know it was kind of um a party Halloween destination. And, you know, it's just it's a sleepy little town for most of the year, but it was getting so rowdy at around Halloween that uh, that the city reacted to that by changing the... Um, 
by changing the last call, by changing the drinking rules. And, like, last call is very sure. early over in Salem. And every time we go down, we're like, join us for a drink after the show. Because that's what we're used to saying for every event we always do. <laughs> and then it's like, you have time to order one, and you better drink it fast. And most of our conversations are going to happen, like, in the alley, in the gutter. Um, so, yeah, so Salem's, it's pretty snoozy, and it's, um, it's, it's Halloween. It really comes alive at Halloween, but it's a very kind of uh, family-friendly, sweet, sanitized, I don't know, I feel like, a, I feel like I'm not selling it in the, in, in the best light. It's wonderful. It's super-duper fun. It's not, I don't know, I guess I think, I think people might have a conception that it's like, Halloween Disneyland, and it's not. It's not that artificial. It's very sincere. No, no, it's wonderful. I, I When I was shooting my very first thesis film, a documentary about witchcraft, I was, you know, <laughs> a rookie mistake. I decided to interview um, Lori Cabot, I believe. She And she said, you know, yeah, come to Salem on Halloween and we'll do the interview. <laughs> oh, my. And then I was going to go to Gallows Hill and shoot there because they do a ceremony at Gallows Hill. And, you know, my, my daughter and my husband were helping me hump gear because, you know, it was in the 90s, too. So I had, you know, gear, heavy gear. Mm-hmm, and we're mm-hmm. following these people in black capes to go to Gallows Hill. And at some point we realized, like, everyone is in black capes. We've been following the wrong people for, like, 20 minutes. <gasps> <laughs> we just have no Hilarious. idea where we are anymore. <laughs> Amazing. So I wouldn't suggest going there on Halloween to do, to do anything but have fun. You know, but uh. <laughs> exactly, and I'm I'm sure it's beautiful any time of year, but it's really beautiful in the fall. It's really rainy and moody, and a lot of old old houses with great big old trees, and we've got an Airbnb that we stay at every time, and yeah, we love it. I'm trying to hook up because um, I did a squeak on a small like a uh, sort of feminist female identifying con in New Haven last December, so I'm trying to hook one up to do it the Hawthorne in Salem in November. After, because it oh, tends to clear cool. out sort of after Halloween, so hopefully I can right. get a decent deal on that. But it's it's a awesome. cool old hotel, so we'll we'll see how that pans out. But one of these days, I'd love to come to one of your performances that, or you know gigs. Um, any opportunities for you to come to New York? Hey man, set one up. We will come. <laughs> New York's not that far from Toronto. No, I know. My daughter like, lives in Toronto. It's like an hour flight. It's nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's not far at all, and I think that's uh, that's something that you know we went to Kingston to do a lecture at Queen's University, and that's because um, a professor was a fan of the show and reached out to us and saw an opportunity. You know, like I I think that's a, again something that. Uh, that we're slowly warming up to for the longest time. We're like, we don't want to do a live show. That's stressful. These are high-minded concepts, and I need my notes, and I need my, I need my, um, I don't know, my routine, my my tradition. I need to enter this space and get in the zone and stuff. So it was kind of nerve-wracking the first couple of times that we uh, that we did it live in front of people. But we're getting the hang of it, and. I keep meaning to do up like a press kit or something that I could send to people and say, hey, here's how many subscribers we have. Here's how many followers we have. Here's how many downloads we have on average. Uh, bring us out to do something. But the thing is those yeah, figures. Yeah, i to see you at some of the horror cons, you know. That would be, I would know, love to great do some. programming. It's just those figures are... Um, unattainable and for the longest time I had a I had a huge gripe against iTunes as if they were I suspected that they were concealing those figures from content creators so that we wouldn't so that we wouldn't know our own worth and therefore request advertising and monetization and stuff like that. Ah that was that was my theory for the longest time, and admittedly, maybe it was a little bit paranoid. Because now, all of a sudden, iTunes is like, "Okay, you can have your stats," and I jump in there, and it's like this many Apple devices subscribe to your thing, and I'm like, "Well, fuck, that doesn't help." That's a piece of the pie, but that doesn't tell me yeah. anything. So, you know, like we have a figure on our website of how many downloads, but I don't know if that means downloads from the site. I don't know if that means subscribers. I don't know if that means people downloading odd episodes out of the blue. Um, you know, podcasting has been around for a long time, but its reporting and stats are still really underdeveloped. 
And so we're kind of at the mercy of our listeners. Like, listeners are hearing this and they want faculty of horror to come to their town. They need to uh, let organizers know. And, um, yeah, I think we have a really passionate fan base, but m- the mainstream horror community is maybe a bit uh, slow to get on our train. <laughs> well, I'm I'm willing to you know put that out there and you know start seeing if you know any of the you know con organizers I know in the horror community be interested because you know that is you, you know you do represent sort of a, something that you don't see a lot of cons. You know, you don't That's see right. a lot of you know feminist or academic, and I think I think you'd bring. Um, a lot to it. Yeah, well, I, I mean, there is a good reason why, but if we want that to change, we need to kind of be the agents of such change, right? Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to come back to New York. It's been a long time. Yeah, uh, we'll have to figure something out. But I did, uh-huh. I did want to say, too, like, just like, you know, as an independent creator, and, you know, I have this podcast now, and I have, you know, YouTube and a bunch of different stuff, and I make documentaries. It's, you know, and then I'm also doing my own promotion and stuff, and, you know, trying to figure out, like, the numbers and the downloads and the SEOs and all that stuff. It's just, it's just a mass, like, it's, I'm endlessly trying to figure out some other aspect of it, the business that, yeah, know, it's not my expertise. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> yeah. It's, no, um, it's still a it's- it's still young. It's still emergent. Like I think, I think we're seeing what super successful podcasts can do. That they can quit their day jobs and and take their show on the road and charge up to uh, you know hundreds of dollars for tickets. I don't think I'll ever quite get there, but um, it's amazing that that's possible. You see that we're happening with life coaches, which I don't understand. But okay. Oh, I don't know that you one. Know, horror can change your life. <laughs> Oh, my God. I could totally do that. I could be a horror evangelist. <laughs> so um, I will definitely, um, if you have any links you want me to post in the show notes, I'd be happy to do that. You know, your website or, you know, whatever, Faculty of Horror, of course, and um, any places people can reach out to you. Would you email me and send me? Yeah, yeah, I can definitely do that. I mean, shit, I think my website has, I think I let my domain expire. <laughs> I am so busy lately. I'm, like, falling behind on everything in life. But, yeah, well, uh, I, mean, I, I can, can definitely Google send you. Google and find some stuff, but if, yeah. Oh, if no, I'm, I'm happy to do that. I, there's, there's just not much, really. There's uh, Rue Morgue and Faculty of Horror and uh, all the social medias where I waste all my time. And then I complain that I have no time. Well, I mean, Faculty of Horror and Rue Morgue are both such high-quality things that the time you spend is, you know, well worth it, so... Oh, thank you. You're entitled to kick around on Twitter when you want to. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you have to have some downtime. Otherwise, you'd you'd have nothing to talk about if you didn't get away from it. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I think that's important. I think if you're going to speak to a passionate, rabid fan base, you need to be in touch with that fan base. You need to, and on the one hand, you don't want to pander to the crowd, but at the same time, you want to know what's, uh, what's up and what's moving people. That's, that's my research, really. It's important really. to interact with them. You know, I found, um, you know, the, my fangirl network was my biggest resource. Before I discovered that, you know, like now Temi will do digital transcripts of all your interviews. Uh-huh. So uh-huh. I had shot, you know, hundreds of hours for this documentary and suddenly needed a script. And I just, <laughs> and I needed it in like a week. So uh, I just reached out to the fangirl community and said, you know, can anybody do a transcript? I'll give you a T-shirt. And I had, yeah. you know, hundreds of people doing the transcripts. I mean, the time codes were fussed because nobody understood time codes. But <laughs> they, they, they got it done. And, you know, it was a really, it, it was, actually everybody was really bonding because reading other fangirls' experiences and interviews sort of brought everybody together. So I think, you yeah. know, interacting in the community on social media is really important. Yeah, and it like it can be toxic. You know, there's always a couple of bad apples, but the great thing about social media is you can you can curate your feed, you can create your reality and, you know, I've heard critiques that that creates an echo chamber, but sometimes I like my echo chamber, my bad case. Yeah, sometimes you have to block. You just, you know, like I'm not even going to you know they're just you know, trolling and they just want an argument and I'm not here for I don't have time for it. I just don't have time, you know. Anyway, great pleasure to talk to you. You're awesome, and I love your work. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. 
Let me know when this uh, goes up so uh, I can uh, promote it. Yeah, yeah, it'll, uh, it'll be up uh, a week Friday. Oh, okay, cool. Sounds great. So I'll, I'll, I'll send you the links and everything. Okay. And uh, keep me posted. Let me know what you're doing, and you can hit me up, you know, anywhere on Twitter or whatever, and you know, keep me, and I'll, I'll retweet and post and let everybody know. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Hansi. Sorry again for yesterday. Don't oh, be quiet. I understand. <laughs> I appreciate it. All right. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you. You too. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us this week on the Gur and Fangirl. If you enjoyed our show, be sure to visit our website, www.streamprojects.com, where you can subscribe to the podcast and our YouTube channel for lots more squee as fuck pop culture content. 